Good afternoon. This is Shahar Samra from Mary and Critical Care Medicine at Jordan University of Science and Technology. In this lecture, we'll be talking about bronchiectasis. We'll be addressing different aspects, including definition, causes, and focusing more on the few diseases that affect the adult, the adult population. We'll also talk about the symptoms and physical findings, how to diagnose it, manifestation of acute exacerbation of bronchiectasis, how to treat it, and uh, the surgical indications uh, of treatment for bronchiectasis. And also we'll be addressing briefly on the new treatment available and under development. Bronchiectasis is an acquired disorder of the major bronchi and bronchioles that is characterized by permanent abnormal dilatation and destruction of the bronchioles, as it requires an infectious insult and one of the following, either impairment of drainage, airway obstruction, and or, or a defect in host defense. So as we see here, infection is required, and for that reason, this is not a congenital disorder for most parts. There is a long list of diseases that can subsequently cause diffuse bronchiectasis. Cystic fibrosis appears to be the most common and it's usually caused by variant protein or mutation in a protein called cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator protein that cause deranged chloride transport, leading to thick viscous secretion formation in the lungs. And uh, because of the thick secretions, there is impairment of drainage, and subsequently, this will lead to obstruction and frequent infections, leading to a permanent dilatation of the airways, bronchioles, and bronchiectasis. This disease usually affects the pediatric population rather than adults, but we have been seeing uh, more um, cystic fibrosis in adult population due to the medical care provided during their childhood. Other causes of diffuse bronchiectasis include defective host defenses, rheumatological or connective tissue diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and Sjogren's syndrome, also post pulmonary infections during childhood or early, early adulthood uh, caused by viral, mycoplasma, measles, or pertussis, and sometimes tuberculosis, and mycobacterium avium complex. This group of infection can cause severe airway abnormalities which might lead to abnormal dilatation of subsequent frequent infections and dilatations of the airways causing bronchiectasis later on in life. Uh, these infections are precipitating infections, not the usual infection we see in bronchiectasis exacerbations, as we will talk about later on in this lecture. Other causes of diffuse bronchiectasis includes allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis and dyskinetic Celia syndrome or Kertigner syndrome. Bronchiectasis can be classified into two categories, either localized, caused by airway obstruction, either by foreign body aspiration, which is usually involved the right lung due to anatomical reasons, or if there is an endobronchial lesion by a tumor, or if there is a mucoid impaction that's chronic enough to cause obstruction of the airway, uh, leading to frequent infections and localized uh, airway uh, bronchiectasis. In this lecture, we'll focus on uh, defective host defenses, post pulmonary infections, and allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis entities. Immunoglobulins are produced by plasma cells, which themselves are the result of development and differentiations of B cells, so any factor that embeds the development of B cell lineage and or the function of mature B cells might result in levels of serum immunoglobulins that are reduced, such in case of hypogamma globulinemia, which characterized by repeated sinopulmonary infections during childhood. Uh, or it can also cause nearly absent uh, in case of agamma globulinemia. So in this case, we'll have an absent gamma globulinemia or 
uh, sometimes will have a normal total uh, gamma globulinia with isolated IVD subclass deficiency. And also sometimes patients with chronic granulomatous disease or HIV will have defect host defense in which will have recurrent bacterial infection and bronchiectasis will develop as a result of frequent infections uh, later in life. Certain pulmonary infections will have severe lung damage after which they will have impaired drainage and frequent infections uh, after that. We have to differentiate between those pulmonary infections caused by uh, measles, mycoplasma infection, for example, tuberculosis, childhood, whooping cough or pertussis, and mycobacterium avian complex. These infections will have severe lung damage and impaired secretions, damage to the airways and after that, patients will have frequent infections from different microorganisms such as the Mephros influenza, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Streptococcus pneumonia, which we usually see with the bronchiectasis exacerbation. So after frequent infection from these organisms caused by the impaired drainage caused by the childhood or adulthood infections, then patients will develop bronchiectasis and then bronchiectasis exacerbation. Allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, or ABPA, is a complex hypersensitivity reaction of the airways that occurs when bronchi become colonized by aspergillus uh, species, which is the fungus. Uh, ABPA most commonly develops in patients with asthma. They will have a long history of asthma and associated with cough, and they will present with Repeated episodes of bronchial obstruction, inflammation, and mucoid impaction leading to uh, central bronchiectasis. Uh, pathologically, patients will have mucoid impaction of the bronchi with eosinophilic pneumonia and bronchocentric glenomatosis. In the labs, we'll have blood eosinophilia with very high plasma IgE level and antibody formation to aspergillus that help when differentiating the diagnosis. The classic clinical manifestations of bronchiectasis are cough and the daily production of mucoperulent sputum lasting months to years. Uh, less specific complaints include dyspnea, hemoptysis, wheezing, and thoracic chest pain. Common physical findings include crackles in 75% of patients and wheezes in 22% of patients. Uh, digital clubbing is a rare finding but can be seen in around 2% of patients. The purpose of the diagnostic evaluation is radiographic confirmation of the clinical presentation. Patients will have chronic daily cough with sputum production an x-ray will show, especially in the chest CT scan, uh, bronchial wall thickening and luminal dilatation consistent with bronchiectasis. The purpose of diagnostic evaluation is also identification of potentially treatable causes and functional assessment. The evaluation might consist of laboratory and lab microbiological testing, and sometimes pulmonary function test is needed. So if we're looking for cystic fibrosis, for example, we will order a sweat test, which is pyrocarbon iodophoresis, and that remains the gold standard. We also might look for genetic mutation in cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator protein, and that will assess also in diagnosing cystic fibrosis. Sometimes we order a CBC for the differential, looking for leukocytosis and neutrophilia. And other tests include Ig quantification or quantitation, looking for levels of immunoglobulins, especially IgG, IgM, and IgA. IgG subclass helps in patients with normal IgG level and subclass deficiency, as we mentioned earlier in the lecture. Sputum smear and culture, looking for bacteria or mycobacteria or fungal infection, might assess also. Remember that the presence of fungus in allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis is not an infection, but it helps also in assessing the diagnosis of ABPA. Rheumatoid factor might help assisting patients with possible underlying connective tissue disease, such as rheumatoid arthritis. Diagnostic evaluation for functional assessment includes pulmonary function test, or PFT. In fact, bronchiectasis was considered as an obstructive 
lung disease, same as chronic bronchitis and emphysema, and they separated them as this has different pathology and has different clinical presentations altogether. But we still see obstructive lung disease changes consistent with obstructive defect in the spirometry and also increased lung volumes or hyperinflation associated with decreased diffusion capacity. If the bronchiectasis is, is localized, usually we can see normal PFT, and sometimes we can see also restrictive defects in PFT functions. Bronchoscopy with obtaining mucosal biopsy can be helpful in hemotylocelia syndrome. Bronchoscopy can also be helpful in obtaining cultures in patients with focal infiltrates. Chest x-ray can show some linear atelectasis or dilated and thickened airways with irregular peripheral opacities and it can be helpful in identifying new infiltrates in patients who have bronchiectasis superimposed by pneumonia. Uh, chest x-ray is very helpful. We look for new infiltrates to define if there's uh, bronchiectasis exacerbation. Um, but we cannot see the special characteristic findings that we usually see uh, in bronchiectasis. So CT scan will be more sensitive towards diagnosing bronchiectasis. Uh, the characteristic finding of signet ring shadows or tram track lines or small nodular opacities, which we call tree and bud pattern, can only be seen by a high resolution CT chest. So these are more of a CT finding than chest X ray findings. Uh, signet ring shadows is a luminal airway diameter of more than 1.5 times the adjacent blood vessel seen. So you can see a dilated vessel next to a blood vessel which kind of resembles a diamond ring. Now when we talk about bronchiectasis, it's more of a chronic illness with frequent infections process. After a while, they will manifest as acute exacerbation of bronchiectasis, which is actually either increased inflammation due to infection or a frank infections or frank pneumonia process. So we can see change in sputum production in amount or color, increased dyspnea or decreased exercise tolerance, increased cough, uh, more of a fever or increased wheezing or change in chest sounds, uh, malaise, fatigue, or lethargy, uh, and also if we order a pulmonary function test, we see there is reduced uh, capacity compared to his own baseline, and also sometimes chest x-ray will show a new pulmonary process. All or any of these factors should be considered as an exacerbation of the underlying bronchiectasis, and some centers will treat this aggressively to help keep the patients around baseline rather than having to progressively get worse with every time they get infections. We have to remember again that this is more of a, an infectious process with colonizing bacterial flora, usually includes Haemophilus influenza, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, from frequent previous hospitalization, or Streptococcus pneumonia, which is less frequent than the other two. So we usually have to consider this as an infectious uh, process rather than just inflammation, and they have to treat it aggressively as such. The cornerstone of treatment is to treat the underlying infection, which seems to be the main reason. Patients with bronchiectasis gets worse in life. So antibiotics includes fluoroquinolone should be given for at least 10 days duration. And if there is pseudomonas infection by sputum cultures, then two classes combined together should be given as anti-pseudomonal antibiotics uh, coverage. Uh, if there is, for example, mycobacterium avium complex, then combined treatment for at least 12 months should be given in such a chronic infection. Now, the role of prophylactic antibiotics seems to be questionable, but Cystic Fibrosis Foundation agrees that patients with cystic fibrosis who are chronically infected with pseudomonas can benefit from azithromycin three days per week to be given chronically. And that seems to help decreasing the episodes of acute bronchiectasis exacerbation. Another important entity of, in treatment is bronchial hygiene, using hydration and mucus clearance using mucolytic agents such as acetylcysteine nebulizer 
and sometimes aerosolized recombinant DNA seems to be helpful uh, in patients with cystic fibrosis, but seems to be bad or has worse outcome in patients with non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis. Other lines of therapy for bronchial hygiene includes osmotic therapy using inhaled hypertonic saline, and that seems to be good for patients who have non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis. Other therapies include bronchodilators, especially beta agonist, uh, which is better than anticholinergic nebulizer treatments or anti-inflammatory treatments such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and sometimes we use corticosteroids especially in patients with bronchiectasis exacerbation and that's in a way is questionable but when we talk about the effect of having corticosteroids this is a short-term effect which is not going to change the immune system or causes the patient to be immune compromised and this is purely used for anti-inflammatory effect. So we usually use it for short term. It depends if we have to use it for a 7 or 14 days duration. And that will not uh, cause any immune compromised status of the patient. Uh, now other therapies that sometimes are seems to be helpful is to use physiotherapy with chest percussion at least 3 to 4 times a day. And pulmonary rehabilitation also is very helpful in patients with chronic bronchiectasis. Other lines of therapy include surgery, which has certain indications, such as removing destroyed part of the lung that's obstructed by a tumor or foreign body residue, or if there is an intractable bleeding that's refractory to bronchial artery embolization, which is a procedure usually is uh, done by interventional radiology, or if there is a part of the lung that's harboring resistant organisms, such as mycobacterium avian complex or multidrug resistant tuberculosis. In these cases, uh, surgery might be indicated. Uh, otherwise, the treatment for bronchiectasis is usually double lung transplant. And why do we use double lung transplant and not a single lung transplant? Is because if we remove only one lung and the other lung is having resistant infections or frequent infections, the transplanted lung will also be affected. So the treatment, if we have to use transplant, is to do double lung transplantation. Now, when we talk about new therapies in development, we can see there's a lot of treatments targeting cystic fibrosis, especially the gene replacement to restore normal production of cystic fibrosis transmembrane conducting regulator protein, or a CFTR potentiator medication, which seems to be promising in patients with cystic fibrosis. In the next two slides, we have an overview of the management of lung disease in patients with cystic fibrosis. And here we can see the, Fs, the, the CFTR modulator therapy, as well as uh, airway clearance therapy we talked about earlier. But an important aspect to focus on is prevention of infection using vaccinations, such as annual influenza vaccine and pneumococcal vaccine. Um, we also talked about bronchodilator, anti-inflammatory therapy. Uh, sometimes they consider oral azithromycin as an anti-inflammatory effect. And we also talked about the importance in cystic fibrosis uh, patients using prophylactic antibiotic therapy of azithromycin. And this slide is a continuum of the previous uh, slide. And uh, we can see here prevention of acute exacerbation using inhaled tubromycin and uh, estronym lysin and sometimes that seems to help also in patients with persistent pseudomonas aeruginosa infection. Uh, other treatments include systemic antibiotics we talked about and uh, the importance of intensifying the airway clearance therapy and the role of systemic steroids as well as respiratory support. This in general helps to remember the special outlines that we use in treatment of bronchiectasis in general and cystic fibrosis in specific. I hope this lecture helped you understand the mechanism and the underlying pathology and etiologies and different management line of therapy of bronchiectasis. I hope this lecture was informative and uh, I was clear enough to uh, cover all subjects and outlines if you have any questions, please feel free to send to me uh, through the e-learning or through the email. I'll be more than happy to answer them back.
please stay safe. Happy Ramadan, and hopefully we'll see you soon. Good luck, and thank you. Good afternoon. This is Dr. Shahar Samra, pulmonary clinical care medicine uh, from Jordan University of Science and Technology. Today's lecture will be about bronchogenic carcinoma, and we'll be addressing different aspects, including epidemiology of lung cancer, etiology, pathophysiology, symptoms. We will also talk about regional and plastic effects, diagnosis, uh, staging, prognosis, and therapeutic options available. We will briefly discuss the role of lung screening available, so I hope that you enjoy the lecture. Lung cancer is the second most common cancer in both men and women after prostate in men and breast cancer in female but it remains the leading cause of cancer mortality worldwide for both men and women as we see in the u.s women have now die from lung cancer as they die from breast uterine and cervical cancers all combined and the concerning part is the rate of cigarette smoking have declined in the u.s but now has increased in the developing nations but such as in Jordan where we can see women now smokes more often than before. Cigarette smoking is responsible for approximately 90% of cases of lung cancer. Uh, thus the prevention of smoking and cessation of smoking offer the most important trout to decreasing the morbidity and mortality associated with this disease. As we see here, a secondhand smoking increases the risk of lung cancer by at least 20% and the risk of developing lung cancer for current smoking of one pack per day for more than 40 years is 20 times that of someone who never smoked. A number of other factors may affect the risk of developing lung cancer, such as radiation therapy and environmental toxins, including secondhand smoke as we mentioned asbestos radon metals uh, or ionizing radiation and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons we have to remember that uh, patients with lung disease such as pulmonary fibrosis might have increased risk of developing lung cancer later in life genetic factors can uh, affect both the risk for and prognosis from lung cancer Although the genetic basis of lung cancer is still unclear, there is clearly an established uh, familial risk. Lung malignancies are classified according to the World Health Organization system. Uh, the most common histologic category is adenocarcinoma, which constitutes around 38%. Most of the remaining cases are squamous cell carcinoma of around 20% or neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, the most common being small cell carcinoma of around 13%. Large cell carcinoma is becoming increasingly rare due to the more uh, biologically based classification schemes at this time. Classification of lung cancers is necessary for appropriate treatments and that will be discussed later on in the lecture. When we talk about uh, clinical manifestations of lung cancer, we find about 5% of patients who are asymptomatic or they might have non-specific constitutional symptoms such as uh, decreased appetite or anorexia, significant weight loss, weakness or fatigue. And when you order a chest x-ray, for example, you find a mass and further investigation will reveal uh, lung cancer or malignancy. Some of them will might have uh, some pleural effusion and then work up will, or further investigation will reveal malignant cells and this will turn out to be secondary to lung, underlying lung cancer. Uh, the majority of patients who present with clinical signs and symptoms due to lung cancer have advanced disease already. Uh, the most common presenting manifestations usually cough in about 50 to 75 percent and hemoptysis in about 25 to 50%. This is secondary to obstruction or atelectasis or secondary to a segmental emphysema can also present in 25%. Patient might recall persistent infiltrate or recurrent history of pneumonia in the same part of the lung 
and that can be from a post obstructive pneumonia which is an obstruction of the airway causing infiltrate secondary to this obstruction and usually this is caused by anaerobic infection or bacteria and microorganisms chest pain can be present in 20 percent now uh, when any of these manifestations are present in a patient with suspected lung cancer they should prompt additional testing like chest x-ray and further investigations right away there are a wide range of symptoms due to intrathoracic effect of lung cancer uh, the most common that we talked about uh, are the cough hemoptysis chest pain and dyspnea but other symptoms can also be present specifically in lung cancer patients such as hoarseness which is more common in the left side tumors due to involvement of the recurrent laryngeal nerve as the arch of the aorta will pull it during the embryology development into the left side of the lung the heart might be involved with malignant pericardial effusion which might also contribute to a lot of uh, heart arrhythmias patients with lung cancer might be complaining from obstruction of the superior vena cava causes symptoms that commonly include sensation of fullness in the head and dyspnea sometimes associated with cough pain and dysphagia but less frequent physical findings include dilated neck veins a prominent venous pattern in the chest associated with facial edema and prothetic appearance as we can see here in the picture it's more common on the right side uh, of the lungs uh, more common in small cell carcinoma than non-small cell carcinoma and sometimes we can see that also in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma lung cancers arising in the superior sulcus can cause a characteristic Pankoff syndrome manifested by pain in the shoulder and less commonly in the forearms, scapula and fingers by involving the brachial blocks as local nerves and tissue uh, which might involve the C8, T1, and T2, which are the distribution of the ulnar nerve. Uh, it can also be uh, associated with Horner syndrome, bony destruction, and atrophy of the hand muscles. It's more common in non-small cell carcinoma, and only rarely seen in small cell carcinoma. Horner syndrome consists of epilateral ptosis with narrowing of the palpebral fissure, meiosis, enophthalmos, and anhydrosis, and it's caused by involvement of the paravertebral sympathetic change and the inferior cervical ganglion. Epilateral flushing and increased sweating of the face may occur before the development of the full Horner syndrome, presumably due to the irritation of the sympathetic change by the tumor prior to frank invasion of the chain. Paraneoplastic effects of lung cancer are remote effects that are not related to the direct invasion, obstruction, or metastasis of the lung cancer. For example, hypercalcemia in patients with lung cancer may arise from a bony metastasis or less commonly tumor secretion of parathyroid hormone-related protein, or sometimes called parathyroid-like hormone secretion. And that's more commonly seen in squamous cell carcinoma, and this will cause hypercalcemia as well. And then we can see a suppressed level of parathyroid hormone, which is secreted originally by the parathyroid the gland. The other paraneoplastic syndrome is hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy and it's defined by the presence of clubbing and periosteal proliferation of the tubular bones associated with lung cancer. Clinically, it's characterized by symmetrical painful arthropathy that uh, usually involves the ankles, knees, wrists, and elbows. Metat metacarpal, metatarsal, and phalangeal bones may also be involved. Uh, the radiograph of uh, the long bones, for example, tibia and fibula, will show characteristic periosteal new bone formation in patients with hypertrophic uh, pulmonary osteoarthropathy. Uh, the symptoms may resolve after tumor resection. The syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion, or SIADH, is frequently caused by small cell lung carcinoma and 
results in hyponatremia. In fact, uh, small cell lung cancer associated with approximately 75% of all malignancy related cause of SIADH. The severity of symptoms is related to the degree of hyponatremia and the rapidity of the fall in serum sodium and can range from anorexia, nausea, and vomiting to up, up to cerebral edema when the onset is rapid. Ectopic production of adrenal corticotropin or ACTH can cause Cushing syndrome and typically patients will present with muscle weakness, weight loss, hypertension, hirsutism, uh, hyperpigmentation and osteoporosis, hypokalemia uh, or hypokalemic alkalosis and hyperglycemia are usually present also. Other rare uh, paraneoplastic Syndromes include carcinoid syndrome, secondary to uh, small cell carcinoma or uh, endocarcinoma, carcinoid release from small cell carcinoma causing carcinosis, and sometimes uh, gynecomastia because of the release of gonadotropin from large cell carcinoma. Sometimes hypoglycemia due to insulin-like activities or hyperpigmentation due to melatonin stimulating hormone release from lung cancer. These are all rare paraneoplastic syndrome that sometimes happens when patient suffers from lung cancer. Lung cancer is the most common cancer associated with paraneoplastic neurological symptoms, typically associated with small cell carcinoma. And they are thought to be immune mediated with a lot of autoantibodies that have been identified in a number of cases. There is different manifestations such as peripheral neuropathy, uh, dementia and encephalopathy, subacute cerebellar degeneration, and Eaton or Lumbert Eaton Massini uh, syndrome. And uh, paraneoplastic uh, cerebellar degeneration is very uncommon associated with any cancer, but most commonly associated with a small cell lung carcinoma. Patients with uh, paraneoplastic cerebellar degeneration typically present with dizziness, nausea, and vomiting that happens acutely and sometimes rapid over uh, several days later, uh, causing gait instability and other cerebral signs such as dysarthria and tremors. Lambert Eaton Mycenic syndrome is uh, um, uncommon and occurs much less frequently than Messina gravis. Uh, most patients will present with slowly progressive proximal muscle weakness, particularly involving the legs, and it has a unique uh, uh, aspect in diagnosis with recovery of lost deep tendon reflexes and improvement in muscle strength with uh, vigorous uh, brief muscle activation, as we can see in the action potential in the middle. Uh, in, the, in the slide here. Lung cancer uh, can spread to any part of the body tissue. Uh, metastatic spread may result in the presenting symptoms or may occur later in the course of disease. Uh, the spread can include bone marrow, liver, or adrenal glands. Uh, small cell carcinoma spread very early and uh, uh, central, nerve, uh, central nervous system can be involved in 20% at the time of presentation by small cell carcinoma, but up to 50% will have brain lesion by a head CT scan or at the time of autopsy. Adenocarcinoma can also spread to the central nervous system much more than squamous cell carcinoma and large cell carcinoma in general. Other symptoms from lung cancer include constitutional symptoms such as weight loss, decreased appetite, fatigue and weakness, clubbing, which they thought sometimes it's caused by a paraneoplastic effect, skin manifestations such as erythema multiforme, acanthosis nigricans, dermatomyositis, scleroderma-like changes, uh, thrombophlebitis, and sometimes uh, these present as migratory, tylosis with hyper Keratosis of palms and soles can be also present in patients with lung cancer. When we approach a patient with uh, suspected lung cancer, a full detailed history and uh, physical examination is very important in approaching such patients. 
the gold standard remain a uh, chest x-ray and preferably a chest CT scan to better uh, localize the lung mass. Uh, having an old chest x-ray is very valuable, especially if there is a lesion that has been stable over the last two years prior to presentation. That indicates that the, the mass is, is most likely benign. Now, the location of the mass can, can give us some clue about the type of cancer that sometimes uh, are involved. So if we see a central mass or a central lesion, then there is more likelihood that this cancer is either a small cell carcinoma or a squamous cell carcinoma versus a peripheral mass or lesion, then it's probably more likely to be adenocarcinoma or large undifferentiated cell carcinoma. We have to be careful when calling the, uh, the masses such way because we cannot really diagnose the patient or the cancer by just having a location. So it's very important to have a diagnosis by tissue. Now we sometimes see calcifications in the lesion and the more calcification we see in the lesion or the mass, that's a higher chance of having a benign lesion rather than malignancy. But this cannot totally rule out malignancy, so we have to be careful with that too, especially in crescentic calcification type of uh, calcification. Now, if we see more of a central or diffuse calcification or more type of laminated or popcorn, then it's more likely to be a benign lesion, but again, we cannot totally rule out malignancy, and we have to rely on the whole clinical picture for that. So how about screening? Uh, like any other cancer, uh, the incidence is still high. Mortality is number one. Uh, all other cancer have their own screening tools. For example, prostate has rectal exam or checking a serum PSA versus breast exam or having mammogram for breast cancer or uh, endoscopy for colon CA. So what can we do for screening? Now, studies show that chest x-ray is not a good tool. And then uh, we had a lot of studies that showed maybe uh, low contrast CT chest can detect uh, cancer early on. So there's a lot of documentation and recommendations uh, by the American Cancer Society from 2013 and the American Chest College uh, Physicians and American Society of Clinical Oncology from 2012. And they both kind of recommend annual low dose CT chest to be done as a screening tool for high risk patients or individuals aged between 55 to 74 years with history of 30 pack year smoking or current smokers or if they quit uh, within the past 15 years. So this kind of shows that maybe screening is beneficial. The studies are still going and some studies are going towards uh, having uh, better uh, survival rates and uh, when you detect uh, tumor early on and treat it uh, aggressively. We can see here a chest x-ray that's showing a central tumor on the right lung, which we call mediastinal tumor. So if we see mediastinal tumor, that's probably a central looking lesion that's probably going towards small cell carcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma. These are different uh, uh, chest x-rays and here we can see by the arrow a cavitary small lesion and also on the right side there is another right lower lobe uh, mass seen obliterating the right border of the heart and causing what we call atelectasis or pulling up the lower part of the lung and that's what we call atelectasis or segmental or subsegmental atelectasis. In order to have a definitive diagnosis, we have to have a tissue diagnosis for lung cancer to be confirmed. Uh, we can rely on a sputum cytology, so if the patient is able to produce a cough and that shows malignant cells, there is no further need for any uh, workup. Uh, you can stop and uh, have the diagnosis confirmed and uh, proceed with further investigation and treatment as needed. But uh, cytology of the sputum is enough. If the patient has a pleural effusion and then you performed uh, thoracentesis and cytology showed malignant cells or pleural biopsy, especially in cases of mesothelioma, is very beneficial. Uh, patient can be diagnosed with different modalities using bronchoscopy. Uh, we have a lot of different modalities sometimes we used in order to diagnose or obtain tissue 
in order to diagnose for lung cancer such as bronchoalveolar lavage, brush, transbronchial needle aspiration, or endobronchial biopsy, or transbronchial biopsy. These are totally different modality but within the bronchoscopy. Sometimes we have to uh, get a thoracoscopy or even an open lung biopsy through mediastinoscopy in order to have a, a better tissue sample. A CT guided biopsy or transcutaneous needle biopsy is another option also when we have a needle uh, transpass through uh, the chest and lungs under the CT guidance to detect the perfect position in order to obtain specimen and have a tissue diagnosis. These are pictures of uh, lung cancer uh, seen by bronchoscopy. Here we can see on the right side endobronchial lesion with irregular shape uh, seen in the proximal part of the trachea. Uh, this is on the left side is how we advance the bronchoscopy through the mouth. Sometimes we can go through the nose as well. Other modalities that we use for diagnosis include bone scan, especially if the patient has evidence of uh, metastatic uh, bone lesions from uh, primary lung cancer. Uh, another modality is positron emission tomography or PET scan. We use that for lesions uh, more than one centimeter in diameter, and it's less specific in diabetic and uh, diabetic patients and in patients with infections. It's not good for metastatic evaluation, although some people will order it uh, before they, they go further with uh, their therapies, but it's not uh, diagnostic. It's not a uh, uh, primary diagnostic uh, test to be used and it's expensive. Tumor markers uh, that we have are still under investigation and none of them are useful at this time. A uh, pulmonary function test to decide if the patient is a candidate for surgery in order to have enough uh, volume or lung volumes to breathe, especially if the patient is going to is going to have a major surgery with resection of part of the lung or if it's big large uh, tumor that we have to resect larger part of the lung then we have to make sure at least that we have a protected uh, post-operative FEV1 of more uh, of 0.8 liters or more in order to make sure that patient is um, safe to go and have that part of the, of the lung resected now, therapeutic options rely on lung cancer staging, and since small cell lung cancer spread very early, surgical option is not indicated in most cases, although there are studies that are going on with having some patients early with early small cell carcinoma resected and treated with chemotherapy, and these studies are still under investigation. Now, small cell carcinoma are divided into limited to hemothorax versus extensive disease when they are spread outside the hemothorax. Now, non-small cell carcinoma has the surgical options. So this is very important that we have to make staging or accurate staging to make sure that patient is a candidate for surgery. And if not, then what other options we have, such as chemo or radiation therapy. And here we have the TNM system classification and T meaning tumor size uh, T for T uh, tumor and N is when there is lymph node involvement and M uh, is for metastasis and this uh, classification or this classification system is adopted in order to stage the patient whether the patient can uh, go through surgery or uh, only chemo or palliative therapy so it's good for prognosis and to guide treatment plan. Although this is a busy slide, it's actually meant to simplify things. Uh, so how we classify patients according to the T system? Uh, as we said, there is the T, which about the tumor size and location. There is the N, which is about the lymph nodes uh, location. And there is if this patient has metastasis or not. So this is the first stage, which is the T stage. So when we classify patients according to their T stage, there is T1 up to T4. And we can see here in T1A, for example, the tumor is less than two centimeters and it's superficial and it's peripheral. Versus T4, this is very close to the major blood vessels and invading the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And here we can see tumor, the pancreas tumor with invasion of 
vertebral body or brachial plexus versus in T3 we can see Bancos tumor but without invasion of the vertebral body or brachial plexus. Now the tumor when it's close to the main crina or involving the main crina, this is T4, when it's closed but it's not involving the main crina then it goes down to T3. So it depends on where the patient has this tumor. So the size and location of the tumor is where we decide to place this patient as from T1A or T4 and then we can go to the next stage. So the next next stage is uh, the lymph node staging and here you can see that the patient can be placed in any of the following. So if there is no lymph node involvement, this is N0. If there is only hyalur lymph node involvement, there is N1. Now N2 has two different kinds. One is when there is hyalur lymphadenopathy. In addition to that, he has metastasis to the mediastinum. This is called N2. And when patients will not have hyalur lymphadenopathy and they will have involvement of the mediastinum, we call that skipped lymph nodes lesion, and that's N2. Now N3, if there is contralateral involvement from the long mass uh, lymph nodes in the hilum or supraclavicular lymph node adenopathy, this is significant for metastasis. So if a patient, for example, has what we call lung cancer-like symptoms, and he presents to your clinic, and then you palpate the supraclavicular lymph node, and it's palpable, and you think there is no other reason why this patient will have supraclavicular lymphadenopathy except from a lung lesion, this is by uh, uh, by default is N3 lesion. Now the third stage is the metastatic stage or the M stage and here you can divide patient into M1A versus M1B. M1B is easy to remember, it's everywhere outside the lung while M1A is when there is involvement in the contralateral lung so there is metastasis inside the lung from the lesion. For example, if the patient has poor effusion then this is metastatic lesion. And it's M already, and it's M1. So after we're done with classification with the T, N, and M system, then we put them together in this table. So if the patient, for example, has uh, what we call T1B lesion, and there is no lymph nodes, and patient has no metastasis, then that's probably stage 1A. Now we look at T3 and we say the, the patient has epsilateral mediastinal lymph nodes, then this goes with N2 and patient does not have any metastasis, then this is stage 3A. Now at any time if the patient has metastasis, this is by default is stage 4. So we use this staging system in order to have prognostic and different modalities of therapies uh, classifications according to the patient situation. Now, when we talk about lung cancer prognosis, it's very interesting to see here that although small cell carcinoma spread very early and there is no option of surgery, as we said in the uh, previously or earlier, um, the median survival rate is one to two years, which is higher than the median survival rate with metastasis in patients with non-small cell lung carcinoma, which is only six weeks to one year. And that's because the chemotherapy targeted small cell carcinoma much better than the non-small cell carcinoma. And the survival now is better even there is no surgical options in patients with small cell carcinoma. 30% will die from local complication and 50% will have brain lesion autopsy. That indicated with how fast or early spread small cell carcinoma uh, versus non-small cell carcinoma. The non-small cell carcinoma is less responsive to chemotherapy and the chemotherapy choice will depend on the performance status and in, in addition to the disease extent and if the patient has significant weight loss will probably be not a good candidate for chemotherapy. Uh, 
So when we talk about lung cancer treatments, here we see small little lung cancer uh, has no surgical options because they spread very early. So chemotherapy uh, based on um, cisplatin and the topocide are the, the, the treatment of choice. Um, radiation therapy is uh, reserved for patients with brain lesions. Sometimes they have it prophylactically, it depends on the patient's situation and uh, uh, case by case situation. And the non small cell carcinoma, here we see surgical option as one, and then we can see chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Uh, surgery is reserved for patients with stage 1 up to stage 3A, and this is the importance of having the staging system. And again, before we do surgery, we have to make sure that patient will be able to breathe after surgery, and we should have a predicted post-operative FEV1 of more than 0.8 liters. Now, chemotherapy is good for stage 2 up to stage 4, and radiation therapy can be used for stage 3 and above, and palliative according to the site that is obstructive. Now, when they talk about adjuvant therapy, this is more of a common uh, combination, I mean, of chemo, for example, and surgery versus chemo and radiation versus surgery and radiation and as such. So adjuvant therapy is a combination of different choices of uh, treatment options. Now, uh, treatment options according to the stages. Here we can see non-small cell carcinoma divided by stages. And you can see in stage one, the surgical option ranging from lobectomy to pneumonectomy but uh, looking for a post-operative uh, FEV1 more than 0.8 to make sure the patient is safe to go through surgery. Uh, stage 2 uh, shows the surgical option is still there, and we have adjuvant therapy. And now when we go to stage 3, it's more of a radiation and chemotherapy combination therapy. But uh, surgery can be also an option in certain cases. Now in stage 4, chemotherapy is the main uh, option here with targeted therapy such as epithelial growth factor receptor uh, in patients with adenocarcinoma seems to be a promising uh, therapy nowadays. This concludes my lecture. I wanted to thank you everybody for listening and hope that I was able to clarify and explain things to you. If you have any questions, please feel free to uh, email me or send me uh, um, text message through the e-learning system and I hope that uh, you all do well and stay safe and hopefully we'll see you after this. Best wishes and kind regards to all of you. Thank you.